My name is Jacqueline Johnson and I'm 22 years old. Growing up, I always believed that there was a God. My mom would always play outside with me. In Romans 1, we find out that creation testifies to God and to His attributes, and that's exactly right. I remember looking at the clouds and the stars and even the ants and just something inside me said, there's a creator out there. I remember my mom praying with me before I would go to bed. She raised me to be obedient to her and to my father. When it came time for me to go to elementary school, I went to a Catholic school. I went through a lot of the Catholic rituals. We had religion classes and we even had mass every Tuesday and Thursday morning. My teachers were moral people. And the idea of being moral just appealed to me. That was something I wanted to be. I remember my first confession. The priest assigned me ten Our Fathers as penance to remove my sin. And from that point on, every night before I would go to bed, I would say those ten Our Fathers. I never really thought I had messed up, but I figured, well, just in case, I want to have a backup plan, and those ten Our Fathers were my backup plan. And from that point on, I always had the idea that spiritually you had to work for things and spiritually you had to earn things. During the rest of my years as I grew up, I was the epitome of a good person. I was always yes ma'am, I was always no ma'am, I always got good grades. The only alcohol I ever consumed was wine at Catholic Communion. I never cursed. I went to Mass from time to time. I would pray often and I would even read my Bible from time to time. And people were always complimenting me. They were always saying, oh, she's such a good person. Oh, she's so kind. Oh, she's so respectful. And I started to believe that I was a good person. And it's funny, because I had this idea that heaven graded on a curve. I thought that God was up there, and he was looking down at people, and he was breaking people down to percentages. And I thought that the top percentage of people were the ones that went to heaven. So I looked around. I saw a man over there getting drunk, I saw a girl over there getting high, I saw this, this girl that would constantly sleep around, I saw this girl that was cussing at her parents, and compared to those people, I felt really good about myself, I thought I was a good person. I thought God was pleased with me, and I thought I was going to heaven when I died. And it couldn't hurt that I had all these good works to back me up, I mean, I was tutoring my classmates, I was going to nursing homes, I was doing all this community service, and I thought, God has to be pleased with me. And that's exactly what I thought. Sophomore year of high school, my mom said, we're going to go visit a Baptist church. And growing up in the environment that I grew up in, you hear all these jokes about Baptists. They're so serious, they don't sing, they don't dance, they dress from another century. But we went anyway. And one of the first things I remember distinctly is actually taking a Bible to church. And not only that, but actually opening the Bible in church. Everyone there was so nice, they were so kind. They weren't falling asleep there, and at first I thought, this has to be fake. But something in my mind says, you know what, it doesn't matter. They're moral people, I'm moral people, I'll fit right in. So we continued attending that church. And some of the first sermons I hear, the pastor mentioned words like, born again and saved, and I had never heard those words before. I didn't even know where the preacher got those words. I thought he made them up, but I figured, you know what, as time goes along, I'll figure out what these words mean. And I graduated from high school, and I was perfectly content with my life. Spiritually, I felt successful. I felt like I was good with God. Everything was fine. And then senior summer of high school, things started to change. For three months, there was nothing but constant conflict and feuding. Day in and day out, there was just fighting. and It started to weigh very heavy on me. I tried to go to my room, I tried to avoid everyone, I tried to pretend like the problems didn't exist, but I was constantly confronted with what was going on in my family. And then one day, this little bit of anger and this little bit of rage and hate just starts to grow. And it gets to the point where it's like a cancer and it consumes everything inside me. It gets to the point where all I'm thinking about is murderous, evil, wicked thoughts. And then one day, those thoughts just turn towards myself, and I start hating myself, I start despising myself, I start hating my life. And I want a way out. I don't want to wait till August to move. I want out now, I want to end my life now. So I thought of different ways to kill myself, and there were a few times where I came very, very close. I realized that it was the grace of God now, but at the time, it made me more angry that I didn't even have the guts to kill myself and the guts to end my life. 
And I remember one time I'm just sitting against the side of my bed. My knees are against my chest. And I'm just sobbing. And something hits me. It's like a moment of perfect clarity. For that moment, I saw that all those murderous, suicidal thoughts were filthy. And they literally made me stick to my stomach. The more I thought, the more I realized that my so-called good deeds and my so-called goodness had nothing whatsoever to do with God. It was all about me. It was all about my ego, my reputation. How did I look? Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful. And I looked back on those 18 years of my life and I realized I had been nothing but deceiving myself for the entire time. And I was more angry with myself, I was disgusted with myself, I was disgusted with my nature. I wanted to change, but physically and mentally and emotionally, I was just too exhausted to try to reform myself. I was too exhausted to try to figure out how to fix this. So I became apathetic. All I wanted to do was stay in bed and live day to day and die and be done with this whole existence thing. I was tired. August 2005, I moved into my dorm in San Antonio. It's about a week or two before classes start. And I turn to a Christian radio program and there's this host and he's talking to this man. And one of the first things the host tells that man is, do you know that in Matthew 5, Christ says being really angry with somebody, being really hateful towards somebody is equivalent to murder? I never heard that before. And I thought the host was lying. I was like, God, there's no way God said that. So I took out my Bible, I went to Matthew 5 just to prove this guy wrong. And sure enough, that's exactly what Christ said. And the guy says, well, I'm a good person. And I would have said that too. Well, I'm a good person. But the host took that man to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. And as the host is going through those verses, I'm reading along. There is no one good. No, not one. There is no one that seeks after God. No one had ever bothered to tell me, you're not a good person. There's something wrong with you. But God himself was telling me that I wasn't good. Immediately I started thinking about excuses. I started thinking about defenses. Well, what about my good deeds, God? What about my good works? And by God's sovereignty, that's exactly what the man being interviewed said. And the host took that man to Isaiah 64, 6. All of our good deeds are like filthy rags. I would later learn that that word filthy rags means menstrual cloth. Outside of Christ, all our little good deeds are an abomination, filthy before God. I started to panic. For the first time in my life, I was scared. I started putting two and two together. If hate equals murder, if there's no one good, if I can't do anything good enough to get to heaven, then, every, then me and everyone around me deserves hell. Then Jacqueline Johnson, Little Miss Straight A student, Little Miss Goody Two Shoes, Little Miss Perfect, deserves hell. And I started to panic. I started whipping out my Bible and going through scriptures. I came across Ephesians chapter 2. And in the beginning of that chapter, it talks about how man is naturally dead in sin, how he's a child of the devil, and how he's a child of wrath, and how that could only change through Christ. What struck me about that passage is that there's no in between. You're either dead in your sin or you're alive in Christ. You're a child of the devil and a child of wrath, or you're clothed in Christ's righteousness, in his righteousness. There's no gray area, there's no in between, and there's no middle ground. And if you would have asked me at that point, does Jacqueline Johnson love God? I would have said, well, I'm kind of in the middle. I don't love him. I'm not one of those Jesus freaks, but I don't hate God either. But you know what scripture says? Scripture said I was dead in sin. Scripture said I love myself more than I love God. Scripture said in Romans chapter 8 that my mind was at enmity with God. I was an enemy of God, contrary to what I would have told you at that point. So then I start thinking, does God require perfection? And ultimately the answer is yes. You have to be perfect to get to heaven. And you know, people say that's absurd. But think about this. God is perfect. God is holy and God is righteous. Based on those characteristics alone, God cannot tolerate sin in his presence. Period. James 2.10 says that you break the law in one point. You tell one little lie, one little time, you've broken the entire law. 
you could give up. Game over. And again, people say that's ridiculous, but what people don't realize, and what I didn't realize for 18 years of my life, is that we are not judged according to a standard that we make up. We are judged according to God's standard. We are not judged by comparing ourselves to people around us. Because the funny thing is, you can always find someone that looks worse than you. You can always find someone that gives your ego a boost, and your sense of self-esteem a boost, and your sense of pride a boost. It's like taking a sheep and placing that sheep against the grass. That animal might look pretty white. You take that same animal and you place that thing against the snow. It looks filthy and it looks dirty. It's not so clean anymore. And that's exactly what scripture does. Scripture is like a mirror. God shows you this is your real nature. This is what you really are. This is really how I see you. And ultimately, this is really all that matters. And that's what happened. God confronted me. He showed me that I had a sinful record before God. He showed me that my mind and my heart and everything about me was filthy, was wicked, was evil, was depraved, was destitute. There was nothing good about me. He showed me that I had no merit in and of myself to save myself. I wasn't good. And more importantly, he showed me that for 18 years of my life, I had sinned against him. The same God that gave me life. For 18 years, I did nothing but shake my fist in his face. I was humbled and I was crushed. Every defense I had ever known was stripped away. And I gave up on trying to save myself. And I, on my face, I cried out to God, God, don't leave me. God, save me. God, forgive me. God, help me. God, change me. And he did. And I turned, I repented from that self-righteous garbage. And I turned from being my own God, from being my own idol. I turned from all that to the God of the scriptures, the one true God. And I can't take any credit for it. I can't get any glory for it. It was all by God's grace. It was all by his doing. To God alone be the glory. To him only. And the thing about Christ dying on the cross, it's not just that some Romans whipped a man and put a crown of thorns on his head. It's that at that cross, Christ took the cup of God's wrath. And he drank that cup, drop by drop. And when the cup was turned over, nothing was left. And Christ said, it is finished. It is finished. And the thing is, Christ didn't deserve that wrath. He was sinless, and he was perfect in word, thought, and deed. He didn't deserve it, but I deserved it. And he took my wrath, he took my punishment for me. And not only did he take my sin, but now when God looks down at me, that girl that used to be so suicidal and so arrogant and so self-righteous, when he looks at that kid, he sees the perfect righteousness of his son. He sees the perfection of his son when he looks at me. And not only that, at that cross, Christ purchased for me a new nature. He didn't use gold and he didn't use silver. He purchased a new nature with, for me with his own precious blood. Ezekiel 36, 26 says that God took my heart of stone and he gave me a heart of flesh. He gave me new desires. The sin I used to laugh at, the sin I used to enjoy, the sin I used to whirl around and I hate and I do stumble. But my attitude towards those things is completely different. My attitude towards God is completely different. He took a soul that was dead and destitute, that was helpless and sinful, and he breathed life into that soul. I used to be a child of the devil. I used to be a child of wrath. And now, by the grace of God, I'm a child of God. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that is exactly what being born again means. That is exactly what being a Christian is all about. This isn't even about just avoiding hell. This is about knowing 
that when I die, I get to spend eternity knowing and being in the presence of my Savior. I get to spend eternity at His feet, thanking Him and worshiping Him for everything He's done, but more importantly, for everything that He is. That's what I get to spend eternity doing. And going to church, reading your Bible, send ten our fathers before you go to bed, abstaining from drinking and having a clean mouth, all these things will not save you. I spent 18 years of my life as a self-righteous Pharisee. I deceived myself into thinking that I was good. I deceived myself into thinking that I was a Christian. But Christianity is nothing short of a supernatural work of God. Examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. And do not be deceived. Do not think for a single moment that drug addicts, prostitutes, and people that go to AA are the only ones that need a savior. Do not get me wrong, those people desperately need Christ. But so do the arrogant, the prideful, and the self-righteous. Do not be deceived. We get to Matthew 7, and there's men and women standing before God on Judgment Day. And they say, God, I said there was a God. God, I said Jesus was Lord. I went to church. I called myself a Christian. I did all these things in your name. And what is God going to say to those people? He's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. So I ask you a question today. Does he know you? Does he know you? Or are you just faking it with your little spirituality and with your morality and with your sense of religion? Let me tell you from experience, you can fool a lot of people. I did for 18 years of my life. You can even fool yourself. Again, I did for 18 years of my life. But God, God will not be fooled and God will not be mocked. Do not think for a moment that you can pull a fast one on God that you could bribe God with your little deeds. God's standard is nothing short of perfection. And if you're not in Christ, you don't meet that standard. If you're not in Christ, you can give all your money to charity. You can do all these things, you can do all these deeds, you can be in the church 24 seven, but it doesn't matter. You have to be in Christ to meet. God's standard. But thanks be a God that we serve a God who shows mercy and shows grace. We serve a God, I serve a God who is mighty to save. He saves people. And he saved me. He saved me.